Hello everyone, today we talk about the Western translations from Greek and Arab during the Middle Ages. So this is a topic I came actually on um, recently on certain videos I made, uh, especially about uh, the one on medieval technology, although I don't remember the title, let me check a little bit in here. Um, but more in general, so discussing the especially the the rise uh, of uh, let's say Western Europe, let's put it in, in this term, um, during the uh, the low Middle Ages. I mean, all the um, you know how the process really happened. It's plenty of these um, um, you know videos uh, on especially medieval society and medieval Italy playlists that kind of uh, express this. I made a video recently called um, uh, let me find it uh, scientific revival of the west 10th 13th century a point on medieval technology that's kind of the the one I can uh, orient to orient you to uh, to be more uh, complete also um, there was something on medieval ships, navigation, and nau nautical science between the 12th and the 15th century that can be also useful. Um, Italian trade and banking in 13th, 14th century. Um, and also maybe something at the very beginning, now I don't really remember, about the 12th century Renaissance. So, you know, if you really want to make a... Um, uh, to, to, to really scope these, the especially the context, the historical context more, these videos are gonna really be fine. So for today, telling the truth, I want to stick to something very simple that is just essentially a broad overlook at how this process of translation uh, occurred and uh, also looking at the major protagonists, let's say at least the most important personalities um <coughs> that are remembered for having carried out the most important work of translation um, and we can immediately say start saying that this is um, we have to focus on the moment of the translation because uh, we don't have to get it so mechanically at a point that I don't know th these books magically arrived from somewhere and the Europeans simply absorbed them and uh, yeah they began to uh, I mean the Western Europeans and began to kind of rise in the way they, they did as a civilization. Uh, as I've said actually many times in, in my videos, it's actually the preconditions that were present, especially in 12th century Europe, uh, were enough um, to make the Westerners uh, looking for uh, those manuscripts uh, of ancient authors that they that had been, say, relatively lost in, in Europe uh, during the, the early medieval times and that they however already knew to be there in in the east mm -hmm. and and therefore this work of translation is very important because wh what you see is lots of westerners uh, basically started to physically go in places like constantinople like um muslim spain um and uh, i mean not really there was also much broader range of this uh, naturally especially in Spain it was mostly a Christian activity at this point it was organized in this sense but but Spain uh, in this sense was benefiting also from the contact with the Islamic culture was out there so close um, and that in fact was the channel through which most of especially in France uh, I believe most of the mm, actual material was uh, was drawn from whereas the Italians for instance took it directly usually from Constantinople and there was also Sicily at this point it was not Muslim anymore but that uh, was still a pretty multicultural um, environment so that the kingdom of Sicily also had this court where mm, it were mm, scholars coming from from all over the Mediterranean and beyond. Um, so we'll just give a look to this, but it's important to stress how active the Westerns were in actually searching themselves for these books. Mm. Because they already knew that they could serve their purposes, and this is also not a very important point. It's not that these Westerners were at this point um, <coughs> cultural elitists like in the Renaissance for which they were searching, you know, stating just that, I don't know, they wanted to 
uh, repristinate um, the classical world in some way through this. These Westerners were actually quite pragmatic, quite open-minded, without any and um, any other aim, however, than profit in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. If you see, um, obviously, was a, a certain degree of uh, of intellectual curiosity and uh, um, and and and. and this is kind of obvious, but if you see especially the, the w what the major outcome of this uh, work of translation was, it was must, uh, mostly something eminently practical. <coughs> Therefore, it's all the more interesting to see how the Westerners were uh, practically already selecting this material and uh, even being able to readapt the contents to things that basically they had already developed. Um, this is also another point. It's, a, uh, it's not, uh, like I said before, it's not that these ideas were completely new, came from the East, and magically the Westerners began to do, you know, uh, things like accounting or, or studying science, philosophy. They already knew a lot, and 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 and, and by knowing this, uh, and only by knowing this, uh, they could actually appreciate these contents and going out there for for searching them. So th this is kind of the key. <coughs> uh, to interpret this um, chapter of medieval history that obviously it's enormously complicated now I just approximated but I think in outline this is what it's fair to remember because um, it's actually how history of technology works mm -hmm. uh, technology is not m uh, m you know in the um, let's say 90% of the time well this is also an approximation but let's say um, really most of the times it's not technology that changes the world it's a world that creates technology for things that uh, already exist in order to make them work better mm -hmm. so this is how the society was seeking for fi for um <coughs> knowledge that by the way we tend to stress perhaps too much the technical and and uh, scientific nature of at least in strictly modern terms because you have to think that still um, such um, um, the, uh, the, the the real point here is um, most of, of these say scientific knowledge was actually philological mm -hmm. and this is not to really diminish it because it doesn't change anything um, we however should understand um, that also the things like technological improvements, the development of society, etc., were things that were happening in the West mm, structurally by themselves. Mm. That's the point. These books were um, like the sherry on, on on the cake, but the the real, you know, the, the, the this was just like the point of the iceberg. The rest was already something that was structurally popping out and this is also how other major scientific um, say improvements were done all throughout history uh, you know why did why were there things like the Renaissance why were there things of like the um, so-called scientific revolution um, uh, well these things existed because there was already a society that could basically sustain them and produce them for solving however eminently practical practical needs um, so I'm very opinionated about this um, so I, I also obviously urge you not to take everything I say if you ever thought to do it, such a thing as um, as literal mm, but um, I think this is, however, how I've really started it, uh, also up-to-dated um, historiography, and this is the general trend we we notice basically all over the, uh, say, in the Western world, academically speaking. So, um, unfortunately, and I say this because it happens to me all the time, and I think it's kind of also productive, also if slightly kind of polemical, I guess, to, to, to tell, is that a lot of people are interested basically in this in stressing uh, a relation of derivation of knowledge of culture like that people invented uh, you know one time uh, 
um, that thing so that thing was basically all that uh, the people got the other people's got for, from that people because otherwise they would have remained like primitive in caves well this is not how history works um, and it will never work by the way like that um, and naturally there is some degree of well I don't really want to go that far but let, let's say that th there are very ideological reasons sometimes that um, un are underneath the crust of such explanations that are allegedly um, you know scientific but uh, practically they're 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 not I mean scientific I mean in academic terms so never think at, the m at medieval times first of all as a sort of dark hole into which it just took to pour books to, to make it grow into something different. Uh, it, it, it never was like that. And um, I wish I could say really more, um, say today what um, I, I can have. So, um, fir first and foremost, however, you basically cannot understand the 12th and 13th century, or even previous centuries, without understanding the importance of um, that the translations from Greek and Arab actually had in European society and culture because think about um, you know uh, the um, Aristotelic system that was eventually integrated into Christianity when, you know when Ar Ar Aristotle came back to Europe during these um, centuries well it was something extremely dangerous also in doctrinal terms because it was a perfect beautiful um, philosophical system that l kind of looked at the world and, uh, and looking, uh, mm, let's say, far beyond also certain conceptions that had been believed at that point, or at least it was radically different and already kind of um, there, um, as um, at least for how it had been translated partially though this is also another problem philological problem because uh, the Aristotle that came to um, to Europe in in the low middle ages it wasn't at all the classical Aristotle it was something very different uh, in uh, in surface at least and also partially partly in contents naturally because of the cultural mediations of other cultures like the Persian uh, one, the Arab one. Um, so, mm, okay, I'm dig digressing now, but um, you have to understand the importance. However, you still have to frame the, 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 these translations into, a, as I was saying before, as, uh, into a greater transformation of European society. And we can say that these translations mostly had a great, Im uh, gave a, uh, an enormous impulse to the um, cultural revival of the 12th century. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all the more interesting, especially if you consider that some of these works uh, were even writ uh, were even Latin works. Mm -hmm. They weren't just from mm, the Greek past. There was also there were also Latin works. Um, and that had gone, let's say, lost in the early Middle Ages. There would be also another very interesting chapter relatively to this, because essentially of the um, the fact that about early medieval times we don't really know excessively much. Mm -hmm. But if you kind of kind of start to, to dig into into the early medieval times, you realize that sometimes we kind of give certain things for granted simply because we don't have m many sources telling us how that world was mm -hmm. um, but um, talking for instance about Roman law mm -hmm. you know that if you read a manual you see you, you read normally things like yeah the kind of Roman law went um, forgotten in the West at this point and uh, but is it this is this really true because Eventually, in the 12th century, we know we have the the first evidence, and you know, obviously, of the revival also of Roman law that was uh, naturally we will see it now um, brought with from from the Byzantine Empire in forms of codes and reused, etc. But what about what happened in the middle? I mean, was the were these co um, these manuscripts were these codes really really lost in the early medieval times? 
Well, also in here, we don't really know. So, albeit the world cultural picture tells us that e even if the Roman law wasn't, ex um, you know, wasn't used anymore, if not partially in some forms that were naturally very much changed in the base of customary law, who really knows um, how many, you know, manuscripts were actually of the um, Theodosian and later Justinian code into Western Europe because it's kind of uh, absurd to think that those are being physically lost. Um, the point here, and, and this is also interesting for history of technology, is realizing that it's not that probably these things were factually lost as as mm, manuscripts. Is that they were kind of, however, they, they, they didn't find an application. Mm. And naturally, this is not really true in in all of Europe, there are also here many kind of differences because it's obvious that were certain areas of Europe that were, for instance, much more in direct contact with the Byzantine Empire than than others w w weren't, and that were more culturally dynamic. They had a society that could uh, get interested mm, in uh, eventually. So. Um, we can't really say a few, but we don't have to underestimate also in here the the mm, we, we have preferably to understand why this loss had occurred, and we don't have to think about of sheer ignorance or sheer let's say um, it, this um, uh, lack of care for for these works, but rather what was the functionality of these works and and why they they fell out of um <laughs> out of date we can say even though uh, we see that in by the 12th century that they were kind of up to date by certain standard obviously roman law was not fully reintegrated was also in here um there were other laws as well so um it's even more interesting because you realize the medieval times actually produced a synthesis that was extremely original hmm? always looking about uh, at the past hmm? Never think that looking about the past and the Roman past was something, uh, I mean, and the classical past was something that only happened with humanism or the Renaissance. Uh, all the Middle Ages were perfectly like w looking at that past. Huh? And also in here, why we remember humanism and, and the Renaissance is not really the beginning of something new, but really the increase in kind of intensity of that phenomenon of going back onto the classical sources, trying to be proper, etc. But um, we would be surprised to, first of all, see how the medievals largely thought, especially in, in, in previously to the late Middle Ages and to humanism and the Renaissance, how they were still thinking, for instance, to be in the, in the Roman Empire. You know, if you ask a Western European, where he was, if he was in the 12th century, I don't know, into Italy, into Germany, uh, into th that if he was in the Roman Empire, and that had th there was basically no discontinuity. Uh, of course, they knew that naturally lots of things had changed, but the general mindset really was very different from our own in the past, in the chronological. Um, it also, looking at at history and and, and so on. So, however, what is very interesting about this is, you see, these medievals really being so th you know, thirsty of knowledge. This is something I believe it's the most important, one at least one of the most important things to, to really, you, you have really have to bear in mind when studying the Middle Ages, that there's never been, arguably in all history, a man that has been more um, inexhaustibly thirsty of knowledge than the medieval one. The ancient world indeed had a completely different approach to knowledge. Um, also the Renaissance in this sense was kind of more celebrative and more canonical than actually interested in the real knowledge. Enlightenment was more concerned of finding criteria to classify, to categorize knowledge rather than actually having knowledge in itself. So I'm, I'm not saying that these were less important uh, phases of, you know, in history of philosophy, of the, the, uh, you know, the human 
civilization, but if you really want to look at the, 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 the moment into which knowledge was really felt as even as a moral duty, surely you can't see it better than in the Middle Ages. Mm. And you can't really feel this anxiety of also of renewal. Mm. Um, so that's why, for instance, we talk about a, a 12th century renaissance. Mm. Because objectively, this was a moment in which lots of things also were already, you know, that were said in that would would have been said in in in, in, in the during the Renaissance were conceptually already there. This is actually something that happens frequently in history. Like uh, if you even if you look at the Enlightenment in the 18th century, well, basically if you look at the 17th century, th most of it uh, had already been told. Sometimes we are kind of tricked by the form um, rather than the contents. This is also another great limit that we have as moderns that um, we mistake the form for the content and therefore we make this such sharp um, uh, divisions between ages and their um, and, and stating you know this way of thinking began from here and before there was nothing like that N really no because if you look at the history of human society you realize most of what is being told is has already been always told for for millennia by someone else in other ways maybe in other contexts with other exceptions with other with other aims with other purposes i mean but the you know the humans were always the same at least in historical times there is not even a biological difference uh, in practice from a genetical point of view so uh, we are essentially the same um beings uh, really posing ourselves arguably you know almost the, the same prob problems mm. even if you look at the history of philosophy especially those currents that eventually be began i mean became big um yeah you can even find within these the, the, the same um um you know, the, 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 these variations, the swinging in, um, in approaches to certain um, kind of key problems that kind of vary wildly, so that even in a, in a kind of a allegedly very mm, narrow mind, I mean, not narrow, say, confined mindsets like certain philosophies can be for mm, by their standards, you notice that these standards can really vary a lot. Um, and um, the anxiety that uh, these medieval Westerners were feeling was definitely th the one for having a, a, a direct contact with the sources of classical culture. So we can't also in here approximating, we can't really um, uh, identify as the major object of interest the um, uh, Hellenic um, philosophical and scientific texts. Mm. Um, here there can be logically a division because philosophy and science, also in, in especially natural science, in the in the uh, ancient world were already separated uh, at least mm, ideally, but uh, it's perhaps most important to stress that also if you look at the classical world, there was a lot of blending of these disciplines in, in part. Mm. And that's why before I was talking about this mostly philological knowledge, because indeed the ancient had mm, produced and um, a huge amount of, uh, of, of texts when which contained a huge amount uh, of knowledge. However, even in you know, and we know this today with with our science, that of course, like if you take I don't know these books of medicine, for instance, uh, yeah, you we're kind of amazed because if we pick certain contents, we say, oh my God, these guys knew so much actually without knowing our physics already. They they really knew how. However, that I don't know certain plants had this effects and no. However, still. A big part of this was still 
kind of anecdotal even legendary in certain times I mean not, it wasn't just obviously sheer no some sometimes it was kind of fantasy and uh, in here and we also have a big problem in this sense because we have to think that also the classical world has left us mostly a um I can't say a theoretical knowledge because it was much practical no uh, knowledge in this but it was most of these works were written especially in Hellenistic times where the authors were mostly kind of um, the elite scholars of the situation that had mostly mm, competitive interests and they wanted to kind of prove to make these big synthesis of of um, encyclopedi encyclopedical knowledge etc and they were surely extremely cultivated people but however they tended also especially in the Hellenic world to to leave away a bit the most practical um, dimension uh, that was felt especially in the Greek world in fact to be kind of not important not important the the Greeks had a very peculiar way of looking at science etc that still influences part also our partly our world like Tol Ptolemy that wrote uh, the Almagestum by calculating all the coordinates um, of every single place in the world at the time but once he calculated them he didn't even bother himself apparently to put them on a map now for us today this would be kind of crazy and uh, we have however to understand it for those times standards because uh, however not because it, it, the, you know there were other ways to move that a map in that sense didn't solve practically much however it was mostly a, a sort of mm, theoretical exercise of getting all those um, mm, coordinates right. Some of them were naturally completely wrong, also because we tried to to write to to kind to to write this map down. But naturally, there was a huge theoretical effort behind that, calculating the distances, you know, the, the how the, the days lasted in various areas of the, you know, the world, the known world, and you know, all these things like. You know that the, the Greeks had figured out how you know the, what's the uh, the the heart circumference with a very um, you know getting mistaken for a kind of a virtually well not really insignificant but however very slow margin of, of error um, in so uh, it's impressive how much they had got right but how their knowledge wasn't really applicable I don't know if this is the right term for that particular um, historical context however and this is, this is valid as well for for the medievals because largely you know it's not that the ancient world was particularly different from from the medieval one in, in the essentials so also these certain mm, scientific problems are something that the Europeans began to pose to themselves for the first time in civilization in the world kind of late uh, mostly during the modern age because that world was changing um, however you see this also modern cartography is something that starts developing only from the end of the middle ages because at that up to that point objectively was no real need for the technological potential of the time of having something better there were other ways that were more profitable to move um, given the the available resources and all this stuff. I, I I kind of insist very much on this because more than these works of translations, I think it's really important to get the history of science kind of better than we do because I realize m most people don't even take into account these perspectives out there. And uh, you know, if I just let you think about these, I'm kind of you know that's my goal just to make you aware if you already aren't naturally that um, that this is an option you you can really look at the thing at um, so when did however the so th we're talking m mostly about Greek manuscripts so here there is a great problem also in linguistical terms because in Western Europe basically Greek was unknown mm -hmm at this point naturally there was someone who knew how to speak Greek or how to, uh, to read it but at a structural level uh, it even 
the you know the scholars uh, the, the greatest scholars in the West the New Greek were really a few. Um, mm, eventually, this starts changing to the low Middle Ages. Um, but Greek had in Western Europe had kind of been lost since. Uh, in in it's difficult to say. However, the, the ma probably the major moment of um, uh, of the major watershed was kind of the sixth century. You know that up to you know the late antique culture was alive, especially in the coastal regions of the Western Mediterranean. Greek was uh, not the first language, but it was, however, sp spoken as a sort of um, lingua franca, let's say, um, and um, it was also you know the the language of the Roman um, one of the languages at least of the Roman elite naturally also by the late Roman Empire the West kind of grew more um, Latin in I mean it had already been uh, Latin naturally but um, it, it was also a progressive detachment of the East and the West think it, uh, just banally about the splitting in Western and Eastern Roman Empire from, um, from an administrative point of view um, so also those kind of I can say national reasons because uh, there were nation there weren't nations as such but indeed I don't know the West for instance the Italic um, um, Senate always felt him to be really the true depository of the um, Latin uh, culture and identity and were kind of right because in the Byzantine Empire was another model. Mm, first of all, they were, especially during the sixth century, was a new uh, kind of gentry uh, growing and to be part of the aristocracy uh, of excuse me of the of the statal, um, Byzantine statal bureaucracy and um, coming from the middle and from from a senatorial perspective, these were parvenu kind of uh, people and there was naturally a much more intense Greek um, identity in the Byzantine Empire um, so it's um, kind of um, so also when we, we tell about the Romans we still have to think that there were substantial differences in here um, then eventually with special probably <laughs> you know with the, the contraction of the Mediterranean trade um, in the European economy you see that this um, Hellenic East kind of remains more enclosed on its own and the West more enclosed on its own so that's the moment in which East and uh, West and East kind of uh, grow apart and actually uh, the, the, the Western country that remained more influenced by uh, Hellenic uh, you know by Greek and let's say by Greek influences was uh, Italy and especially southern Italy and Rome that were always um, connected to uh, you know way or another to the Byzantine Empire as the Byzantines basically um, leave Italy for the last time only in the 12th century and and these were also there were lots of coastal um, uh, centers that were so directly close in 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 trade and communication with um, the the Byzantine Empire, so that's where you're gonna find more influences. Also, um, there were a lot of shifting of peoples. Thinking about when there was the uh, iconoclasm, there were also a lot of refugees coming from places like I don't know, or uh, all during the the Arab invasions before. Um, um, that came from I don't know from Syria from Hellenic Syria into into Rome and um, so it was a bit more in, indeed Rome was um, probably one of those few centers in Europe where um, Greek was kind of more understood kind of more however uh, Rome was still very Latin in, in, in this sense in linguistically but there was um, definitely also a greater interaction with Constantinople for sheer diplomatical terms were um, lots of interests uh, so that's why but however the rest of Europe kind of, of Western Europe kind of grew practically undetached from Byzantine influence at that point at least at a also at a strictly social level not just in diplomacy or stuff you know and uh, and that's why basically uh, it's the 6th century that we can say that the knowledge of Greek also kind of gone 
at that point they immediately lost also the sixth seventh centuries especially up to at least for for, for centuries to come um so instead and this kind of goes without saying uh, in constantinople such works kind kind of kept leading uh on and not just in there so not just in the byzantine world but also into the islamic world and the jewish world uh that were extremely uh soaked with um hellenistic culture mm. um the arabs immediately got uh, everything from from the because they realized it was extremely profitable to to know and it also in there was kind of a, an interest for for pra in practical terms knowledge was something really precious mm. in many ways and you realize something very important that i know that the, mm, at least now to be a kind of a new frontier of r of uh, academic research um d there is a field of study that basically um takes into consideration what the Arabs um, basically um, inherited from the Hellenistic world that even Byzantium had lost. Mm. You know, when the Arabs get immediately places like Egypt, Syria and Palestine, you have to think there was a, l a freaking lot of, 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 of libraries in there. And amazingly, we know also through the Islamic expansion in some regions there can be even in, in the far east of Asia, for instance, that the the uh, the Muslims brought also in their literary traditions and all a lot of knowledge about the the Hellenic world that we for instance we don't see in, in the Byzantine Empire at that time anymore. Mm -hmm. So even the Byzantines kind of lost a lot of uh, Hellenic um, knowledge by, by this fracture of the Islamic invasions. For instance, just make a banal example. Um, Alexander the Great is a much greater hero in kind of the Islamic tradition than in the Christian one. Although even Christian um, epics is more based on definitely on uh, Alexander the Great than on the same Christian um, paladins and all. So these are things that have really to make you let you think because there is indeed um, even especially when looking at this moment of kind kind of coming back of that is very much stressed even as an action as, as a physical action of the all this knowledge from the east we have however to bear in mind that we're talking about this area of eurasia the especially revolving gravitating around the mediterranean as and nor uh, therefore north africa as well as a world that kind of had shared in the essentials the same culture since the hellenistic the, say the classical times so that even stressing too much this division, so saying, I don't know, at a certain point the Arabs arrived and kind of cut off the bridges between Europe and uh, the Near East. Well, this is actually false. And I if we didn't um, see that in sheer evidence in terms of trade and other interactions, w I it would be even also very uh, false just for looking at the even the exchanges that were present uh, even previously to to these times like the 12th century that were always there was always an interaction was al always a kind of influence uh, which is also t to be understood uh, as mutual mm. um, as westerners especially we like to stress i think the fact that we got the thing from the east because from our perspective that's how you know the things we already had in the west we kind of give them for, for granted and this was not even in the East, in vice versa, in the sense that there were many influences also that the East got from, from the West. However, um, the um <coughs> so another very important element of this process is that the Byzantine, uh, Arab and uh, Jewish world worlds had um, not just taken these works, but they had already translated them by themselves. The Byzantines didn't need that because they were already um, Greek-speaking, wh whereas the Arabs naturally had to translate them in their own language, just as like the Jews did. And the Jews in this um, were um, 
in this sense that they were there were also some of the great hairs of the um, classical civilization because they kind of lived through that um, and they were already there I mean uh, Hellenism was an extraordinarily important influence on Judaic culture and literature and etc even on Christianism you can argue that it was uh, an Hellenistic it was in the, in the wake of an Hellenistic tragedy. excuse me I drink a little bit <coughs> excuse me So, here, tr the work of translation is, is important because, it, it, mm, you know, there is all, as you know, all a, 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 a huge field of the philosophy of language um, that naturally tells you that how can you really translate a language? I mean, when there are languages that have cer certain terms that are maybe they're usually translated in, in in that way but that in the original language have for instance a, a, a wholly different etymological origin so how can you really render that so there is always in the work of translation a loss of the previous um, knowledge uh, of, uh, the, the, of yeah the sheer knowledge that that word contained this can happen interestingly as also as the uh, linguistical um, changes occur in the same language. Mm. For instance, the Byzantines were very uh, elitistic in the way they regarded their past. They kind of stuck to the classical age as the model and this arguably brought eventually also to a sort of crystallization of um, the Byzantine culture around certain models that arguably were also the same thing you can't say for their politics and society and that therefore couldn't uh, th or at least they had great difficulties um, in part to kind of adapt to new situations so even uh, here naturally medieval Greek was not the same of uh, the ancient uh, Greek just for, for saying uh, once and, and these changes are uh, in translation are mostly even especially in the Arab speaking world and uh, also in Judaism <coughs> So not only translations, but here, probably most important than, than anything else, uh, they were also commented. Um, so that um, this, this other huge chapter of the comments of the classical uh, sources, especially in the Islamic world, that is what eventually kind of was also partly the more dynamic, because the Arabs um, at this point uh, were kind of more especially at the very beginning that they had been more opened uh, in a less dogmatic way to the classical past because it's something that they kind of uh, enter in contact uh, with at that very moment their world was still relatively primitive so there was um, no cultural resistance to this um, knowledge to the integration of this knowledge and also in here no real dogmatism so this knowledge was in part naturally corrupted through this process, but it also uh, provided produced um, in the process a great um, cultural enrichment of the uh, classical texts uh, coming from, especially the Arab world, not really to be conceived as Arab in point. Uh, we are talking about the Arab world as the world also of the per of the great Persian culture, of the great Indian culture of worlds that in this sense were more detached for instance from Europe from f from Constantinople for instance so that the Arabs instead went just recently I made a video about uh, the history of medieval India um, and 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 in there was I think uh, um, helpfully uh, stressing how the um, for instance India is this world that in the West was kind of considered mythical and uh, far away wh while for, for the Arabs this had been kind of next door so even the various influences that you can find in the comments in here are something extraordinary and um, and, and these are all additional knowledge was brought into the West and and that's why they this also I highly influenced the same European philosophy because reading Aristotle from the original is extremely different reading it from its medieval commentaries and, uh, so 
it's naturally um, very very important and I wish I knew more so perhaps I, I, I might start making um, certain videos on medieval philosophy to, to get more in in detail to this but it's just an idea but if you just let me know in case if you're interested about this in the comments um, <coughs> so mm, naturally in this process of uh, translation you have to understand that the, the Europeans had gone in intensifying a lot the relations with the Eastern world and especially with the Arabs um, not because the Byzantines weren't um, but Byzantium really kind of worked like a big power that was kind of also in less uh, I mean it kind of had a more firm stand even in the relation with the Westerners the Arab world all over the Mediterranean was kind of more fragmented so this in part favored kind of also the, the more direct interaction especially with the um, uh, through through trade to uh, mercantile say commercial activities and so on um, I discussed this in especially in the in, the, um, uh, in that video about the um, a point on uh, medieval technology I don't now I don't remember how it was called however the This naturally um, was, um, I mean, all the the, prob the linguistical problems that had been that we've been talking about relatively to the translation, etc., were kind of known by the Westerners. I mean, the Westerners was they were only at this time kind of figuring out, for instance, how to translate from Greek or Arab or or, or uh, Hebrew. Mm, but in this sense, they kind of were still aware of the fact that we're d doing a translation on their own it's kind of obvious so this also put them in front of certain choices naturally the more exposed um, lands in Europe to these um, contacts were Italy and Spain um, so in Italy the the major translators um, were from cities like um, Pisa Genoa and Venice so these major maritime republics that had naturally uh, mm, cons uh, continuous relations with Constantinople with the Islamic world um, and uh, therefore we remember certain very important names like um, uh, um, um, Burgundio uh, Pisanus so Burgundio from Pisa um, the, uh, this was mostly important because he translated um, the um, also certain uh, texts of the fathers of the church uh, but also Galenus for instance so you understand also uh, the religious point of view naturally is very also very very important it was a a re definitely a renewed interest also in the late Christian literature that in part had naturally been uh, Greek uh, in origin, even the same, obviously the same Bible. So, um, however, very important is also to look at the figure of these translators. For instance, who was uh, Burgundio Pisanos? He was a jurist. He was a lawyer, essentially, not just a translator. These, these weren't. This is also a very important thing to to tell. We just we hinted um, to before that is the eminently pragmatical reasons for which these people began to tr translate those texts texts mm -hmm. that makes the whole thing kind of less resounding but also it makes you understand better why this was done and kind of what had hadn't been done before um, for instance um, the uh, digestum of uh, Justinianus wa of Justinian sorry was this um, uh, in part translated by, uh, from by Burgundio from, from Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there is um, also the Expositio Fidei uh, Orthodoxe, uh, the um, Fonte uh, Sapientiae, 
from uh, John uh, Damascenus, who had been an important Arab uh, theologian, uh, the uh, Liber de uh, Vindemis mm -hmm. um, from the uh, Geoponica. There were these essentially collection of, of um, were uh, originally from the um, these were uh, compiled from um, in the tenth century by the under the Emperor Constantine uh, the seventh, um, and there were twenty books on agronomy. Mm -hmm. So why you know Italy at that time was really on the lead also on agricultural da forms of you know our exploitation of the lands uh, and the systems like so wh why do you think that these w these books were known because they were you needed because these people were getting curious on how to do that things that were doing kind of better mm -hmm. so as we said um, Burgundio translated also Galenus the Complexionibus mm -hmm. and um, very importantly also the uh, Omelie ad Evangelium Ioannis and the Omelie ad Evangelium Matthei from um, uh, John Chrysostomus, uh, John uh, uh, of Antioch that was this extremely important um, figure I in back in the f uh, f it was the f between fourth and uh, the beginning of fifth century he was uh, had been Archbishop of Constantinople a very important figure one of the uh, his uh, the his homilies were kind of a one of the peaks of the uh, rhetoric at the time. I mean, w we we're looking at indeed um, also a world that, as, as we've seen, it was not completely you know, which was entirely the, a classical one at least in how we mean it. We find works that also came from the very late antique or the uh, even the same Middle Ages as as we have seen and. Uh, the so uh, another very important figure uh, we can m mention was uh, James from Venice. He was a translator as well as a, a canonist, mm -hmm. and uh, he's better known. Um, oh, we didn't uh, say when these guys leave. Well, the um, James from Venice was. Um, he kind of lived in the first half of the 12th century, roughly. He was probably born at the end of the 11th. So, even a world that is kind of still really early. Uh, um, so, James from Venice was mostly famous for his translations of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, therefore, he uh, is also one of the first translators that... Um, um, you know, the, the last person in in the West that had translated uh, Aristotle had been Boetius back in the sixth century. So, kind of uh, James of Venice is kind of the first one, at least that we know, that translated the Aristotelian works directly from ancient Greek to Latin. Mm -hmm. So, kind of very important uh, figures in this sense, and. About James of Venice, we know really a few, telling the truth, because you have to take also this in account. It's not that we have a great, uh, in this time, by the 12th century, great biographical knowledge about these individuals. And we know this this was just a, a clergyman from Venice. Mm -hmm. Then we don't really know uh, pretty much. Some, some of these authors kind of qu even quoted each other, because naturally they were also, uh, there was all a... We can't often see that directly from the sources, but we can even understand there was even a very wide net here of of studies, of um, of, com of uh, communication, of, uh, of learning, of uh, consulting. Of inf uh, uh, these were mm, individuals that also uh, traveled al physically a lot, um, so that really moved themselves. They they went in places to, to you know control libraries to to write things down. Uh, at this time, you have to think also manuscripts were a kind of fortune in sheer um, economical terms. So owning a manuscript at this time was something was a was a luxury good, essentially. It could be so precious, but at the same time, it it, it wasn't just a material reason because these manuscripts were built 
usually with uh, hundreds of skins of animals and that's not something cheap at the time but uh, uh, you, under you, uh, you understand that it really starts to it starts to exist a sort of kind of um, market value of these manuscripts uh, that, that naturally developed mostly around the quality of I mean the, uh, around the contents that were present in these manuals so this is arguably how humanism was already born as such and you know in, in certain measure also existed existed before and the for instance the uh, both Burgundio Pisanus and and James of Venice were at Constant in Constantinople also with other um, with other fears there were also certain Germans who were there um, also these were mm, individuals who were involved in uh, kind of um, we said that juridical and even theological disputes that is not a few because it means that they had to be th these were kind of the intellectual elite o uh, of the time um, and um, so there will be a lot, actually a lot of interesting things to say about this, but um, just to mention uh, a little bit the impressive amount of works in translated, or at least allegedly, because sometimes it's difficult to understand. I mean, uh, philologically, you know, at least there are certain traditions who claim, you know, that guy translated that, but eventually there is no real proof. However, we're still talking about this milieu that were evidently were, however, such works were really. Uh, circulating. Um, the uh, James translated um, uh, the um, physics of Aristotle, the metaphysics of Aristotle, and probably the um, De Anima, as it was known in Latin, on, on the soul of uh, always from Aristotle. And um, th th there are also other kind of Sometimes these works were also translated in part, so there, there, are, there is a list also of other works in translated similarly just in certain books. Not just because they, they had gone lost, but because maybe you know that, that they just had available one, one book at a time because they had found it out somewhere else. Um, for instance, he translated parts of the Organon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so always in the Aristotelian uh, philosophy that had been partially trans uh, already translated by Boetius in the sixth century. Um, there are really many other works, um, and the um, uh, the and. and it's important that these works, uh, as we were saying before, also circulated widely in all the rest of the continent. For, for instance, John of Salisbury knew James of Venice's work, uh, and other important figures in you know in the Western world were actually uh, pretty updated on the uh, the advancements that were being done into the uh, the. Uh, there into Italy. For instance, most of these um, works are actually today's in uh, the um, um, in uh, Avranche, uh, which is in uh, uh, it's in Normandy today. And uh, th these are all the books that came from actually from the um, uh, where they are the manuscripts that came from the uh, library of the Abbey of Mont Saint Michel. That was, by the way, historically very much in contact with Italy. So we have really this long-range um, circulation of, of knowledge and that gives you how Western society was so already intertwined or interconnected and capable of, of share not just of translating but also of sharing this material. Mm -hmm. So that's really different from, from how it happens today. I mean, we, we, we change the media but our curiosity, our interests, the way things are shared and f people want to know, they're kind of out there the same way. They're kind of moving, at least for me, and I think also that's the reason why uh, I hope that Schwerpunkt <laughs> will be followed by someone, because it's kind of... You know, I know there are people, sometimes there are people interested out there, but maybe they don't have a mean, they don't have someone who's 
picks up and uh, therefore I think it's important also to, to do what I'm doing for, for kind of the same reasons for, for that uh, you know it makes me smile to read what these medievals were doing because they're, they're the same <laughs> very same things we're doing right now and they did that better than us <laughs> well of course there's really no better nor worse. So you really have to understand the context and uh, looking at that for, for there. Um, so here we have seen the Italian maritime republics, right? So, however, there is also in the um, the 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 Kingdom of Sicily that, as we mentioned before, was also pretty much involved in this um, work of of translation. And we also entered at the pretty multicultural environment that especially the uh, court uh, court of Palermo was, was really about. So we had uh, Greek, Latin and Arab cultures meeting in, in this uh, extremely effervescent, intellectually effervescent and dynamic environment. Um, in Sicily, the major interest also here was for the Greek um, um, world but the Arab component was also much higher than what, what it was also in, in the West and it seems that the Kingdom of Sicily was also pretty much interested in the strictly scientific texts mm -hmm. um, why well this is probably difficult to answer I speculate that uh, I don't know well I, I don't want to maybe maybe there was some kind of uh, you know the Sicily in, in the center of the Mediterranean having also these great contacts and traffics being open to the sea in general is something that always remains interested in kind of practical reasons rather than strictly ideological ones that can be more strictly to to literature to certain ideological models um, it's obvious that the I don't know the Sicilian sovereigns were had arguably different um, ideological interests than, I don't know, the French sovereigns, for instance. Um, so it would be interesting to compare. Usually, I don't know, France at this time was on the lead for uh, theological work. Northern Italy was at on the lead uh, for uh, juridical work. So all these are differences that you can kind of uh, understand looking at what was happening at the local level. So the there, there were two functionaries of the Norman um, court that also here are were to be mentioned. Uh, the first one is Henry Aristippus that is this guy was born into um, southern Italy and eventually came to to work into uh, Sicily and he uh, he was our, um, a man of letters and as well as a uh, as a clergyman he was arch uh, archdeacon of Catania in Sicily and uh, he was pretty active in the court uh, during the um, he essentially lived in the into the first half of the first three quarters, let at least let's say, uh, of the 12th century. Um, and, and also here his name is important because he was one of the first translators from Greek of um, scientific and philosophical works that otherwise were not known before him, at least uh, as I was saying before, we kind of get the first historical evidence through the work of this guy then it might naturally happen that uh, there were others who had done it but that history kind of forgot its if, uh, their names sadly but we kind of know that they existed so we can ideally <laughs> uh, you know think about them um, as well and the Um, the I, it seems um, that there was also a very important, you know, the, the in in the kingdom of Sicily, there was also a very important um, uh, medical school of Salerno that was at the time on the lead for in medicine. Also, thanks to these um, 
Greek and um, Arab uh, text circulated and surely uh, Henry had uh, contacts with that and um, the he was also um, very uh, interested in uh, similarly in in scientific events allegedly uh, it, the Mount Etna in Sicily was now had been observed during an Iraq uh, uh, eruption um, that um, the it was just imagine it how it could be in you know figure the, the physical knowledge of the time you know it was these were kind of amazing events uh, that also in fact ancient sources had documented and so and all these things um, he he um, Aristippus uh, translated for in, in Latin for the first time we know at least in the mid of the 12th century the uh, Menon and uh, the um, uh, the uh, the Phaedon. Um, so of of Plato and uh, he um, and also he translated the Meteorologica of um, the four, uh, at least the fourth uh, book of the Meteorologica of Ar Aristotle. Mm -hmm. uh, he he translated also um, uh, Gregory uh, uh, Zenus um, who this also this prominent figure also in hero for, for late antique time it was one of the father of the church fathers of the church and uh, uh, this was uh, by the way uh, uh, asked uh, dir directly from the king of Sicily William the first and uh, he also translated parts of the um, um, the works of um, Diogenes uh, Laertius it was mostly interested in um, the uh, history of uh, he wrote a history of the um, the lives of certain philosophers and uh, there was also there was um, um, one of the uh, this guy had lived in the first centuries after Christ and uh, he um, these were naturally very uh, very influent men and it, they even had certain political roles naturally so you can't imagine in fact Henry Aristippus also died in prison because a uh, he was uh, accused of treason by the king of Sicily and uh, he died that way so these were extremely clever men that were also involved in much more than just intellectual activity this is also another thing we tend to forget how multi uh, how polymatic these uh, scholars were actually were and how uh, their their horizons were extremely wide uh, um, how they were involved into very material political things sometimes and uh, uh, there is also uh, Eugene the uh, the hammer mm -hmm. Um, this also was a very important figure um, at the court of uh, uh, of, uh, of Sicily. Um, the um, the, uh, the um, his main uh, uh, accomplishment. He, his name in Latin was actually Eugenius Amiratus. And he was actually a an admiral of the kingdom of Sicily during the 12th century, and he similarly was uh, originary of Greece, or at least he had a Greek origin uh, in uh, in language that doesn't really. Uh, um, and, and his major work, however, did this is he he translated from the Arab the Al Majestum, so this is extremely important text. Uh, of astronomy or uh, and the optic from Ptolemy, uh, nonetheless. Um, so the um, you look at also this man. He was responsible for administra uh, uh, He had administrative tasks. Uh, he was involved in economical activities, and um, and he was also a poet. Um, he um, so really look at the. Well, uh, you know uh, the the broader culture of these of these people. The um, 
he he translated also the uh, Eritrean Sibylla, for instance, the Eritrean, as it was known in in Greek. Um, the, uh, the there are also uh, other traditions relatively to what other works he translated, though we're not really sure about them. However, this was another important uh, important name. However, uh, talking about Spain now, uh, Spain was, um, so between the 10th and the 11th century, was some of the most advanced uh, countries in the world. Uh, the um, Caliphate of Cordoba, I mean in Europe, let's say better, <laughs> because, you know, um, the Caliphate of Cordoba was this very important um, even exception, in especially in, in Western Europe, geographically meant uh, as it was a kind of a centralized state with a professional army, a tax, a fisc uh, tax system, and also and the cultural, uh, the Arab culture developed in here was extremely sensible to the uh, Greek thought, mm -hmm. and especially they were still open to to Christianity and. The uh, the caliphate also had lots of um, very consistent uh, Jewish minorities, mm -hmm. so the Iberian Peninsula was extremely um, fertile ground for these cultural cross section uh, from ex excuse me uh, cultural crossing, um, and the there was especially um, so na naturally these are the centers of the Reconquista etc. and in the city of Toledo, eventually. Um, um, we find the um, the figure of of um, of um, Raymond of um, of of the so uh, Soveta, mm -hmm. and um, the excuse me, I was looking at one thing because I wanted to look at yeah, okay. So um, Toledo at this time was naturally uh, part of the Christian domains. Mm -hmm. So, however, this was still extremely influenced by uh, Arab society. Also, because during the Reconquista, partly you know it, it it was very difficult to really tell you know this is Christian, this is Muslim, because also the the identities were really quite mixed uh, and uh, it doesn't matter how f they formally were kind of recognized uh, but really the especially knowledge as you understand flowed independently of religion and of uh, ethnicity and so on so the, the Toledo had been conquered by um, by by the Christians into the uh, end of the into the eighties, if I'm not wrong, of the eleventh century, and and in here was installed uh, an extremely important uh, school of translation. So a center that basically um, began to kind of specialize in this activity. And interestingly enough, it was um, being created by, in fact, the the the, the bishop. Raymond de Sauvetat, who was actually French, not Spanish. Uh, he was a Benedictine monk born in Gascony. And however, he went, uh, you have to, to think naturally, also the church, especially this was very multi, uh, multicultural right, in many ways. And he uh, settled in uh, the school of, uh, the Toledo School of Translators, let's say better. Uh, better. Um, and oh, by the way, he's famous also because he ordered the um, current the constru uh, reconstruction of the Cathedral of Toledo. That is marvelous if you ever go to Spain. Uh, I haven't never seen it, but uh, I've um, seen it in pictures. Kind of a very, um, very beautiful place to go. I've never been to Spain, sadly enough. Um, albeit, kind of <laughs> had luck to travel intensively in other countries. Um, but these are, you know, if you're interested about the Middle Ages, into the Middle Ages, you 
should really go to visit Spain because it ha in multiple times because it's really big and there are so many different places and this is a, uh, also very yeah with, with a kind of a history on their own Toledo is definitely the the core of um, especially in this time of the Castilian power mm -hmm. but it had arguably been always important uh, both under the Romans and uh, it was the capital of the Visigothic Kingdom then also under the, uh, the Muslims etc so it's worth uh, visiting and um, uh, Raymond was um, Archbishops of uh, Arch uh, Archbishop of uh, Toledo from um, 1125 to 1151 so these are the year and we find a lot of different you know, uh, uh, we find intellectuals with a very varied uh, background. For naturally, there were the Spanish Christians who were uh, working in, in the cathedral school, but there were also converts, uh, uh, converted Jews, um, and um, other mm, scholars coming really from all over Europe. So it was a very uh, international center. For instance, one was the um, um, was um, uh, uh, Herman of uh, Carinthia, also known as Herman uh, Dalmatin. Uh, known in, in Latin, you find him written like Sclavus Dalmata. Was actually not. Uh, therefore, I think he was kind of uh, he was a Slav, hmm? as uh, he was known as uh, from uh, you know at that time the the, the, the South Eastern part of the Holy Roman Empire was uh, encompassing these lands in the... he was a, he was a Dalmatian mm -hmm. so also in there quite interesting place because Dalmatia is between the Byzantine Empire uh, Italy um, uh, Hungary Germany so it's a place that really has many impulses many uh, different influences and um, he is also one of these great polymaths, uh, Hermann lived from um, the um, roughly in the first half of the 12th century, kind of died in the 60s. So it's interesting, by the way, how these first figures are kind of all, uh, these translators, these first translators are kind of part of the same generation. Mm -hmm. So this reinforces the fact that it was not an accidental episodic thing that someone found a book somewhere but it was a massive structural uh, ability of the westerners to go get there and organize these this activity um, and Herman is um, together with other mm, figures that we'll also see a, a bit later one of the most important translators of especially of astronomy of Arab astronomy during the 12th century and he um, one of the greatest divulgators of Arab uh, scientific culture all over Europe at the time and and, and, and his works especially gave a great impulse to the development of um, medieval European astronomy mm -hmm. and remains kind of this um, uh, he he translated the Quran as well. Um, the and he translated also two treatises relatively to uh, Muhammad. Uh, the in Latin they're called the Generazione Muhammad et uh, Nutritura Eius, mm -hmm. so the birth of Muhammad and his um, kind of ed education, say, and the uh, Doctrina Muhammad, the doctrine of Muhammad. And um, I think he didn't uh, finish the. Um, to translate the Quran, however, it's kind of interesting that it was this Christian interest towards the Muslim uh, world as well. Um, he, by the way, he w he was a Benedictine monk as well. He he was from Istria actually. He was he was not from Dalmatia, but he was he was from Istria. So this crossroad of civilizations really. He had studied in France. Um, and uh, he even before that the um, the University of Paris was created mm. so we're looking at also the world that as we were saying before is also relatively primi uh, allegedly primitive and that so even before the universities kind of began to be 
developed in the way that they would massively spread eventually in the, in the following generations. But it was still capable of putting into motion so, so much. He, he lived in Chartres um, and he... Uh, the there are many things we could say. He was a he was very um, Herman was very interested in Platonism as well. Um, that uh, this time, you know, the, the, the West had been um, having lost Aristotle was had had been a bit of stuck to Platonism also for influence of Saint Augustine, uh, and um, this was and 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 that's uh, and that probably. Uh, in in France, that Hermann met uh, even before going to Spain, these uh, classical texts that uh, even if they were flowing fr in, into there from from Italy and Spain, um, and that were revealing all these mm, uh, amazing knowledge that naturally attracted most uh, vivacious minds. Um, that there were also but there is interest it's very interesting to re to look also to um disciples of these um of these figures for instance um uh, herman traveled um t uh, into the eastern mediterranean together with um uh, 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 robert of uh Kitten, known in latin as robertus Kitanensis, uh, who was also another very important um, theologian, uh, English um, theologian, uh, astronomer, and Arabist, um, and translator during the uh, late Middle Ages, and uh, excuse me, during the 12th century. So, really great, um, uh, uh, great figures that kind of all knew each other, and because they also had been one, can, you know. Uh, masters and and and, and disciples and, and so on. And um, and 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 after the uh, having, you know, gone into to Constantinople, into Syria, so having get, get got to know Arab science of the time, he got back to the, he he went to Spain, and he uh, started also in there to 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 assist in this um, school of Toledo for the translation of the. Um, um arab sources um and thi this is an uh, in a sp is an especially interesting uh, figure um the so the uh, now that we mentioned them th there was plenty also of um, um of uh, of english uh, s um, scholars one of the most important is definitely Adelard of uh, Bath. Uh, in in Latin, it's Adelardus Batensis. Um, he believed also in here between the end of the eleventh and the first half of the, uh, of the twelfth century. Uh, he was a uh, therefore also in here a, a British uh, philosopher, mathematician, astrologer, uh, astrolog um, astrologer. Uh, how you know how to say that? And um, and he translated mostly as, as astrological, astronomical, philosophical, and mathematical works. Mm -hmm. And he also wrote uh, original works on, on his own. And um, the uh, the uh, he he one of his, his most important original works are the Questiones Naturales. So the essentially the natural questions the natural pro um the eodem et uh, diverso so this um it means on on the different and the um on the s on the equal and the different mm -hmm. uh the avibus tractatus this is also very interesting um he it's um it's known as th this is a treatise on birds mm -hmm. uh, also known as the cura cipitrum or the curis cipitrum that is this um, the um, Canada was also a lot of interested in for towards falcons for fowlers and also you see also I made a video about um, 
Frederick II of Wallenstaufen as man of science it also wrote a uh, as a Holy Roman Emperor he wrote a a treatise a, a treatise of uh, I mean not as a Holy Roman Emperor but considering the figure he wrote um, um, this uh, work on falcon uh, on falcons because he was pretty keen about that as most of European nobles at that time as they went hunting with falcons so Adelard's works by the way were all uh, written at this point as a sort in the form of dialogue uh, or letters to a uh, nephew mm. and um, what is interesting especially about the naturales questiones is that or questiones naturales better um, it's um, you know it, 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 the, this treatise is, is in the form of a answer to the questions of uh, Adelard's nephew on what Adelard had known from his studies on the Arabs uh, while the other works are uh, the other two works are respectively on the studies over the Greeks and the English uh, this is kind of interesting because in, in this process there is of translation there is also kind of a rationalization of the rela uh, of the relation with other peoples by the way, consider at this time that um, there was no real <sighs> watershed. I mean, mm, also between certain peoples that were conceived as kind of. The d um, it's important also that d how these peoples kind of characterize themselves and kind of t to differentiate themselves from the others. And there are many other. In these works, there are many other interesting things. For instance, about the shape of the of the art uh, of the art that Adelard believed was uh, spherical, and uh, and he explained how the uh, basically the art could remain in this sense uh, idling in into space, or um, or what would have happened if there had been a an extremely long hole. Um, carved into the uh, terrestrial crust um, once it would arrive to the um, center of the earth you know just think about what these peoples were really thinking about you know the, the also this myth that the medieval thought that the earth was flat actually it's false at least by s a certain you know it wasn't always like that um, and it, it um, he also theorized well, what is th these m other s surprises you also for how deeply they 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 postulated certain physical ideas that today are also kind of mm, subject of debate how um Adelard, um i made an hypothesis th that matter cannot be destroyed um the uh, so we're talking about the law about the um, uh, you know th th this we're f uh, thinking about the the time of Lavoisier so the law on the uh, kind of conservation of the mass that would have been developed so many uh, several uh, centuries later so th these guys were s already thinking about these things he also wrote a uh, a short treatise on the abacus known as Regule Abaci, so the rules of the abacus and um, a another one on, on the astrolabius and, and there is ah, interestingly a manual of chiromancy um, so it known as um, better known eventually as chiromancia parva or chiromancia uh, adelardi um, another important work of Adelard was the um, uh, translation of the astronomical tables of al uh, Khwarizmi mm. and the introduction to our astrology of Abu Mashar. Mm. Um, uh, also, he translated part of the elements of Euclides from Arab to Latin, and uh, which was to become naturally the most important text into at the European schools of, of mathematics um, and 
and and there are by the way other translations that were done in in following centuries on the base of the translations were done by these tr uh, former translators in the 12th century this is also very important because yeah you know once you have a perfection knowledge maybe after some centuries but you still want to base yourself on what others have written this is something we do all the time after all it's it's like we i don't know we go on the internet and we want to read i don't know a historical source in translation you go check the sources and you maybe can translate them a bit on your own but you help yourself with the translation of someone else so this is what the, these guys were were doing as a matter of fact so uh, also alert of bath is an extremely fascinating um character and uh, oh by the way um, Adelard of Bath was active also in, in Chartres as we've seen for uh, uh, Hermann of Carinthia and he also uh, was to Sicily mm -hmm. so this is also kind of uh, uh, important uh, another figure very important is John from Seville. So he was a uh, he was he was Spanish. Um, um, so from here from the uh, and uh, he was a translator as well as an astrologist, mm -hmm. always of the 12th century. And uh, he the we don't really know where John of Sevilla is. Uh, probably he was Galician, so from the very north of, of Spain. The uh, he he made um, among his translation were the um, Secretum um, Secretorum, that is a, a, la a Latin treatise um, attributed to um, the that was later attributed to, to Aristotle, but it was in fact f created in, in, in the Middle Ages, it was uh, known as the pseudo Aristoteles, because this is also an important point that uh, for most of the Middle Ages there were lots of works that were believed to be part of a certain author and that it really wasn't. For instance, the, different be be the difference between Plato and Plotinus was discovered only in the 15th century, so there were lots of. Um, uh, also, yeah, of course, Plato. I mean, Plotinus was, uh, aside from the name similarity, but you know, he was a Neoplatonist as well. So also, their do Platonic and Neoplatonic doctrines were pretty, pretty much. Uh, there was this uh, relation of derivation, but it's still interesting that th there were works like in this case with John of Seville, that, that were attributed to ancient authors and they were fakes. So the problem of uh, <laughs> of fake news, it's uh, here although it's a bit different because these were treatises that actually contained pretty substantial information that we we don't have perhaps much time to explain why th these fakes were created, but sometimes it was also accidental, really, in the, the way it happened. It was attributed to someone simply because maybe f someone found this work and didn't know who had written, and kind of postulated it was from Aristotle, and instead it wasn't. Okay, but this happened all the time, really, uh, and. And also that derivation from you know the Arab commentaries, etc., was not really fully known. Also because if you really w what you get is only that um, work at that time, it's uh, you know uh, so a, a lot changed also in, in the Renaissance because of the um, refugees from Constantinople, from from the uh, Ottoman advance that went from from Greece with f with their books and manuscripts. Uh, into the West, so bringing other sources can eventually disproved these ones that had been created for for a way or another in the previous centuries. Um, John from Sevilla, um, the also uh, translated 
um, the work that in Latin was eventually known as the uh, De Differencia Spiritus et Anime, so the literally the difference between uh, the spirit and soul uh, of the Arab philosopher, 9th century Arab philosopher um, Custa Ibn Luca. And, and these are all works um, of um, of uh, about medicine and mixed together with uh, alchemy, mm. and and this was especially um, a particular tradition of the um, Arab, let's say uh, Ibero or Hispanic Arab world, were kind of obsessed by by alchemy and you know mixed mixed with medicine and all these things. Um, the John from Seville also uh, John of Seville also had uh, extensive knowledge on maths, and he already knew the decim the Indian decimal system, um, and uh, that eventually, however, would have been uh, mostly you know. You know, it's it's usually the Italian Leonardo Fibonacci that is from Pisa that was credited into the Liber Abaci to to have introduced that. But this is a pretty good example to show how c certain knowledge had maybe already been known by someone before, but eventually it entered uh, in into Europe more massively through other channels. In the case of Fibonacci, because th that was uh, he introduced that as a as an account practice, you know, it's something that was um, very um, very pragmatically meant uh, to to be of use. And um, the mm, there are also other works that were translated by John of Seville, always from Arab uh, into Latin from, from Arab mm, treatises of astrology uh, etc. Then another figure once again uh, is uh, Robert of Chester so another Englishman. I, I kind of, uh, <laughs> of, of introduced um, John of Seville quite <laughs> I was talking uh, about English I was listening now English scholar Stone and truth um, so he um, he this guy I don't think when he we know where he, either he was born or uh, you know when when he he died uh, nor when he was born however he operated around the mid of the t uh, 12th century um, also in here a polymath he was an English translator, mathematician, astronomer, and Arabist. Mm -hmm. And he translated very important Arab works into Latin um, from very important Arab authors like um, Abu Musa uh, Jabir ibn Ayyan and al Khwarizmi. Mm -hmm. And um, such uh, works such as the uh, Liber uh, Algebra at uh, Al Mukabala of Al Khwarizmi on uh, so this treatise on uh, algebra was um, eventually translated uh, also by uh, Gerard of uh, of Cremona, who was a Lombard, uh, that eventually was mm, you know he, Gerard of Cremona's um, translation of the same work would would be more widely known and uh, he uh, Robert of Chester also translated the Liber the uh, De Composizione Alchimie so uh, another treatise on alchemy uh, translated in 1144 and um, I think also in here the first um, Robert translated also the first Latin edition of the Quran in 1143 Robert of Chester also he was one of those who worked into to Spain mm -hmm. and the um, w what we don't know really about him if it was the same um, uh, hair of uh, Adel, uh, excuse me a disciple of Adelard of Bath because certain sources tell us that he was 
uh, those uh, that Robertus uh, Caterensis that we know what to be the disciple of Adelard of Bath and traveled with him into the east mm -hmm. um, although we still think that they were two distinct people as they are told to be working in different places uh, at the same time by sources Incidentally, both uh, at the same time in, in, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, so it's kind of one in Navarra and the one in Segovia, for instance, but uh, whatever. And uh, we also met, met uh, Gerard of uh, Cremona, mm -hmm. that I already discussed in the video on medieval, um, on medieval uh, technology. The the one, excuse me. Now I'm gonna finish this video because it's getting long and pretty tired today for other reasons. So I don't want to be too long, but just wanted to mention that video again. Yeah, the scientific revival of the West, 10th, 13th century. This is the title. So, uh, Gerard of Cremona, as we were saying before, he's, well, he's also an extremely famous Italian translator. Um, he was born in Cremona in 1114 um, and died in Toledo himself. In, in, um, as he had gone there to, to research, to, to translate, to find the works to translate uh, in 1187. And he translated the Almagestum of Ptolemy mm -hmm. as well. Um the by the way holds in here the, these figures are somehow credited especially for their authority to have translated works that uh, as a matter of fact they, they they really didn't um the and and the um he he was an extremely cultured man. I mean, well, I, I don't know what to really add. Maybe about the translation. Now, this experience in Toledo was definitely very very important. He actually went there by himself, um, uh, actually because he thought that in Italy, in in into northern Italy, that there was no enough interest for philosophy, as the Italians at that point were mostly interested in these um, more practical things like uh, law. And um, and accounting and stuff like that. So he went into Toledo as he knew that there was much more about philosophy in there, and uh, that's how where where he went there. Mm -hmm. And um, the and he stayed there for for a freaking long time, by the way, to like thirty years or even more, like more than forty years, seemingly. And it, in 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 and it, that's in Spain that um, Gerard learned Arab. And, and this allowed him to, to read uh, Ptolemy's Almagestum. And that's uh, what made it translated, um, indeed. And the. Mm, what can we had about this? Uh, I don't really know. However, he um, translated a huge amount, however, of. Works. We think about the word at least sen seventy-four works. So just think about what this man did, and these were um, these all were all from Arab. So we're talking about uh, Muslim scientists and scholars such as Ahmad ibn uh, Muhammad ibn Kathir Al Fargani, so known as Al Fargan uh, Al Farganus in in Europe. Um, let's just stick to the Latin names: Jaber, uh, Anaritius, and uh, and other great um, Albucazes, Radzes. I mean, we uh, great names of of the uh, Islamic scientific tradition. And and, and here, in fact, um, among these works, uh, there were lots of works on physics and astronomy uh, that were. Or uh, from Aristotle, but also works of logica like the Analytica Posteriora, with uh, the comment of um, 
of other uh, of, of Domitius in that case because by the way certain works have been already commented not just during the Middle Ages but also during the same ancient world mm -hmm. uh, there was also the 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 causes that was another pseudo Aristotle uh, at the time it wasn't really known uh, before um, the the this this last um, work, especially through the uh, and and also um, the comment of Tamistius was extremely important because it it basically uh, developed um, a, a Platonic uh, current within the Aristotelical tradition, uh, and and this uh, had a huge impact in uh, into medieval. Um, philosophy and also well through the, the early modern age as well so it's very interesting to to see how these works of translation and tr even the same choices could practically influence even the same um, uh, they, they, they kind of gave this genetical imprinting to the to the um, to eventually the, the 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 available knowledge that was used into philosophy uh, for for many centuries to to come. Um, the there would be actually a freaking lot of things to say. Maybe uh, we'll dedicate a whole video just to Gerard of Cremona, um, but. There were, for instance, there were the so-called tables of Toledo that were um, published by Gerard uh, in Latin. And this this was a compilation of astronomical data that came from the Sasanian times, and this was like the most advanced compilation of astronomical data ever known in Europe by that time. So, uh, by the way, there were translations also from more recent works, also of Arab scholars that had existed in into uh, had lived into Spain in the previous century. For instance, Al Zarqali, that was known in the West as Al Zakel, and was uh, an Ar uh, an Arab mathematician and astronomer that had lived into Cordoba into the eleventh century. So this was also relatively recent knowledge. Mm. Um, the mm, Al-Farabi also was uh, an excruciating figure. Uh, Jared translated, and 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 Jared also, uh, as like other scholars that we've seen before, composed other treatises of uh, on his own, like especially about algebra. Uh, and uh, arithmetics and astrology and um, also a certain um, um, that he understood much about geography a concept about latitude and astrology as well really a big mix naturally uh, maybe uh, he translated, by the way, also in here um, uh, medical works from Galenus and Hippocrates. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's stop with this list because it's kind of getting boring. But it, it, uh, telling the truth, it should be thrilling because um, just think at how what what kind of great minds these really were. So at the end of the 12th century, what you see is that the Western culture ha was getting enriched with um, countless works. And by the way, um, w which were had been this? Well, almost everything from Ar Aristotle. Aristotle. I said Aristotle before. Ar Aristotle, the same. <laughs> um, and and in Europe, you have to think before the 12th century. The only Aristotelian work was the, the one on the logic. Mm -hmm. Also, Euclides was first uh, now completed um, in as a 
in translation into Western Europe. And the same goes for other uh, Greek scientists like Archimedes, Hippocrates and Galenus, as we have seen. Um, there were also other works from very important ones from the um, from the uh, Maimonides, Moshe ben Maimon, who had been born in in, in Cordova. This he was a prominent uh, Jewish um, philosopher and uh, doctor. Um, um, Averroes and and his uh, commentaries on uh, Aristotle uh, were also translator, sorry, translated, and um, especially lots of ma also of maths, uh, uh, mathematical treatises were translated, like in one of al as uh, we've seen, who had in invented kind of uh, algebra, we can't say. Um, but a lot of other works about astronomy, natural sciences, medicine, uh, among these, for instance, the canon of the Persian Ibn uh, Sina, known as um, Avicenna by, by the Latins. And you can make a point on the, also on the relative um, inaccuracy of these uh, translations, because, as you can imagine, they weren't really um, faithful to the uh, original Greek texts, because the Westerners were just beginning to learn Greek uh, at this point, and therefore it was something really. Uh, um, th these texts, as we said before, were also adapted to certain practical needs, uh, besides the sheer mistakes. Uh, 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 this goes uh, naturally also for Arab and, and Jew, um, and Hebrew, sorry. However, they were still crucial works uh, that managed to enrich the cultural heritage uh, that, especially the Middle Ages, um, passed to the modern age. Mm -hmm. This is uh, um, that's a, a very good way not to kind of be um, so uh, this idea that uh, the, the the modern age kind of uh, came up as uh, the Middle Ages were a dark hole where nothing happened. M most of what in the modern age was studied was already being tr written, translated, and and read into the Middle Ages. So uh, I don't know why there is so much uh, naive um, naivety, let's say, on, on on these topics, especially today. You know, perhaps we need to feel that I don't know the modern age was something completely Western, in in in, in kind of in because Europe began to rock it eventually to the, and we don't want to 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 acknowledge that in medieval times, these uh, great uh, there was s so such a great synchrosis of with the uh, Christian. Um, um, you know the, the Western uh, European, the Byzantine, uh, the the Arab, um, uh, the Persian, uh, the Indian traditions, and we don't want to face how the, the what w how it really was because I believe this is the reason. This is why many people kind of refuse that because th there are. I it's difficult to admit that civilization is something that has no color, it's not has no. Uh, it's something that comes from lots of people who bring things together trying to, to make them work and um, so I will come back naturally on um, the history of technology history of science in during the Middle Ages because um, there are certain prejudices I think have to be fixed into pop culture and if anyone comes across these videos and kind of starts thinking maybe in a different way that's that's gonna be useful for for many and today this list more than else was aimed at giving a bit the the awareness of the 
of the curiosity of the Europeans for the other world worlds that were out there secondly also the fact that these were Europeans all together working uh, so we have seen um, there were uh, Italians, Spanish, um, Germans, Slavs, uh, English, um, French. So kind of the whole Western Europe kind of sending the best in into centers like the school of uh, Toledo, for instance, and really creating kind of a European identity by certain standards. You know, Europe at this time was not really something didn't really exist as as something much more than a merely geographical thing. Uh, these especially these people were more concerned in the West about being Christians rather than Europeans. And this is something that is also very important to understand because it was a kind of a legacy that came straight from the ancient world where it didn't matter where we really uh, came, uh, you know, uh, especially in the harbor of the uh, Roman Empire, the later the Christian Empire, as such. Um, there was not really a problem where, where, where you came from or which language you spoke, as long as you kind of were part of this uh, universal world. And, and you have to take into account, even though we have seen that uh, this process partly also, uh, you know, process of translation etc also sp triggered the rise of awareness for towards the differences that existed before we've seen it with Adler of Bath for instance was kind of talking about the English as such and naturally yeah of course the, the word those identities pretty strongly already in in some ways but we're coexisting let's say also with others that were arguably also more important at least they were in certain um, among certain intellectual elites were surely considered more important than a strictly say national one ones so uh, excuse me if I sound extremely tired but objectively I am <laughs> and this video has been uh, long enough I'd say and uh, so we're stopping it here so for now um, I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time